In this presentation, we will introduce concepts related to inference for numerical data. Prior to watching this video, you were expected to have previewed Section 7.1 of the textbook. So let's start by talking about the so-called sampling distribution of sample means. From the central limit theorem, when we collect a sufficiently large sample of independent observations from a population with a mean of mu and standard deviation sigma, the sampling distribution of sample means will be nearly normal with a mean equivalent to the population mean and a standard error equal to the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. Now, recall that when we modeled the sampling distribution of sample proportions in chapters 5 and 6 using the normal distribution, certain conditions had to be satisfied, namely independence and the success-failure condition. In a similar vein, there are two conditions that are required to apply the central limit theorem for a sample mean x-bar. So the first of the two conditions required for modeling x-bar is exactly the same as what we saw when we were modeling sampling distributions of sample proportions, and that is the independence condition. The sample observations must be independent. The most common way to satisfy that condition is when the sample is a simple random sample from the population, or if we're doing an experiment, if the data come from a random process analogous to rolling a die. Instead of the success-failure condition that we use when working with sample proportions, the second condition required for modeling x-bar is called normality. When a sample is small, we also require that the sample observations come from a normally distributed population. That's the condition. However, we can relax this condition more and more for larger and larger sample sizes. Now, since that's somewhat vague, making it difficult to evaluate, we're going to introduce a couple of rules of thumb to make checking this condition easier. So on the slide, you can see the two rules of thumb for performing the normality check. I'm not going to read through those because these are drawn directly out of your textbook. So I will leave those for you to go ahead and pause the video and read through those on your own. However, in passing, I want to go ahead and take note that in a future video, we're going to look at the logic of the above two rules of thumb for checking the normality condition. In addition, I want to highlight one other thing, and that is you'll notice that the key sample size, a cutoff value, if you will, for separating the two rules of thumb is this size of 30, when sample sizes are less than 30 or greater than or equal to 30. Now, in practice, we can't directly calculate the standard error for the sampling distribution of sample means because we don't know the population standard deviation sigma. Remember that we encountered a similar issue when we were computing the standard error for a sample proportion, which relied on the population proportion P. Therefore, our solution is going to be very similar to what we did before. We're going to employ the strategy of using the sample value in place of the population value when computing the standard error. So notice in the formula below, instead of using sigma, we would substitute the sample standard deviation in place of the population standard deviation. Now, the strategy on the prior slide works well when we have a lot of data and we can estimate the population standard deviation using a sample standard deviation accurately. However, this estimate is less precise with smaller samples. And this leads to problems when using the normal distribution to model the sampling distribution of sample means. Therefore, rather than using a normal distribution as our model, we're going to use the so-called t-distribution, which provides the correction needed to resolve the problem of using sample standard deviations in place of population standard deviations in the standard error calculation. The t-distribution looks very much like the standard normal distribution in that it is bell-shaped with a center at zero. However, the t-distribution also has a single parameter associated with it, namely the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom, in this case for single samples, equivalent to the sample size minus one when modeling the sampling distribution of sample means using the t-distribution, describes the shape of the t-distribution. The larger the degrees of freedom, the more closely the t-distribution approximates the normal model. Now, in the preview for section 7.1 of your textbook, 
you were given some practice on sketching t distribution curves and that's pretty much all that preview required you to do now i want to take some time to look at a few examples of how we can use our guru to find proportions of the t distribution with given degrees of freedom and t values and then secondly i want to show how to find cutoff t values given a certain area under the curve to the right of the t asterisk value that we're finding so for our first example of using our guru for t distribution problems i've drawn example 7.2 from the textbook which asks the following question what proportion of the t distribution with degrees of freedom equal to 18 falls below a t value of negative 2 and 10 hundredths and you can see the sketch of that situation shown below so within our guru i left click on probability simulation go to probability left click on that left click on continuous in this case we're working with what's known as a student t distribution so i change the drop down menu from normal to student t i leave the values to probability function checked the degrees of freedom was given as 18 so i fill that in and for any work that you do with t distributions these next three boxes must have values of ncp 0 center 0 and scales uh, scale of 1 you will never change those three values in this course we now come down here i do want below and the value of the t value that i want to find the probability below for the area under the curve is negative two and ten hundredths and i click my preview and there is the value and to four decimal places that would be 250 ten thousandths now that we've shown how to use our guru to find the proportion value for degrees of freedom of 18 and a t value below negative two and ten hundredths you would put on your paper the following work for your use of our guru i'm not going to read through that but you must include this as your work whenever you use our guru for finding a proportion value uh, as i just demonstrated now for our next example of finding proportions of t distributions i'm using example 7.3 from our textbook which asks what proportion of the t distribution with degrees of freedom equal to 20 falls above 1 in 65 hundredths below you can see a sketch illustrating that situation shading under the curve is to the right of 1 in 65 hundredths now instead of demonstrating how to use our guru in this case since it's very similar to what i just showed in the previous example i'm just going to show what you would need to write on paper for performing that particular uh, for finding the answer to that problem. The only differences that I want to point out in this case of what you would write is you would have the word above rather than below, and then of course the value one in 65 hundredths, and then of course my final answer is still written to four decimal places and was 573 ten thousandths in this case, and we note that that is what falls above one in 65 hundredths. I would of course encourage you to go to our guru and make sure you get the same result as I did for this problem. Now I want to take some time to show a couple of examples of how to find critical t, that is t asterisk values, using our guru. So the first example is drawn from exercise 7.1 part a in the textbook. I want to find the degrees of freedom and the critical t value, that is t asterisk, for the given sample size and confidence level. So I have a sample size of six and a confidence level of 90%. So as we did when we found critical Z values or Z asterisk values in chapters five and six, I first need to find the area in the upper tail corresponding to a confidence level of 90%. So you can see the calculation work that I've done on the screen and I come up with a upper tail area of five hundredths. So going to our guru, I left click on probability simulation, left click on probability, left click on probability calculator continuous, now, in this case, I'm going from a probability to finding a T score or T value. So I click on that radio button. I select student T distribution. Now, in this case, my degrees of freedom is equal to five. It is one less than the sample size. So the sample size was six. So my degrees of freedom is five, one less than that. These three boxes still remain the same. I have an upper tail area that was 0.05. And then I hit preview and I get my T score of approximately two and two hundredths to two decimal places because we round those 
to two decimal places just like we did with z-scores. So coming back from our guru, I would complete my work on paper by writing the following two things. So here are the instructions for how I used our guru that I would need to put down on paper. And then of course, my final T asterisk value that was computed with our guru. All right, so our final example in this presentation where I'm gonna find another critical T or T asterisk value is drawn from exercise 7.1b of our textbook. Here I'm asked to find the degrees of freedom and critical T value for the given sample size and confidence level. So I have a confidence level of 98%, sample size of 21. So the degrees of freedom is gonna be one less than that, that is 20. And the critical T value is again found using the same steps that I just demonstrated for the previous uh, problem. Here I'm not gonna go ahead and show, I'm not gonna demonstrate the use of our guru. I'm just gonna show the work that would need to go on paper for finding the critical T value, which is two and 53 hundredths in this case. Again, I would strongly encourage you to go through our guru and make sure that you come up with that same value when you do so on your own. And that concludes this presentation.